Again, I would like to thank those of you that are tuning in. Uh, those that have tuned in on multiple occasions have enjoyed uh, the messages. Uh, we are located in Wilton, New Hampshire, Good News Bible Church on 27 Hutchinson Road. And we meet at 10 a.m. on Sundays. And we would love to have you come visit. If you do not have a church home, uh, please come and visit us and be blessed. Thank you. Located about two miles southeast of Jerusalem, on the east side of the Mount of Olives, is a little town named Bethany. This was the hometown of Martha, who owned a home in which her sister Mary and her brother Lazarus also lived. Some scholars called this the Judean home of Jesus because it's believed he spent a considerable amount of time at that place, in that home, and with that family. We see in Luke chapter 10, 38 and 39, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him, a welcomed invitation. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. They were teachable and they loved the Lord. And we see again in Matthew 21, 17, and, and he left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night, no doubt. He spent it at Mary and Martha and Lazarus' home. So as we begin this message this morning, I want you to think for a moment about your close friendships, the ones that you spend time with, the ones that, that you would call your, your really good friends. What draws you to them? Are they reliable? Will they be there for you in your time of need? Scripture reveals to us that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were close friends of Jesus, and they shared meals together. They laughed together. Jesus taught in their home, no doubt. They prayed together. They talked about the healings and the miracles, the things that were happening as Jesus conducted his earthly ministry. This was a place in which the Lord could get away to from the rigors and the strains of ministry, come into this home and, and just relax and enjoy fellowship. But this close family was about to experience an overwhelming interference. Sickness came upon Lazarus. But this family knew the miracle worker, the one who had healed so many people, and some of those healed were, were people that they knew. So these two sisters, they trusted Jesus, and they knew that he would come and heal their brother after all. Is that not what true friends would do? So as we enter into this historical event, we see the sisters of Lazarus appeal to the love that Jesus possessed for their brother. And furthermore, for our benefit, John states the Lord's love for this family. John chapter 11, 1 through 3, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of, of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And then in verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Just a quick note. A couple of weeks ago, we spoke of Simon the Pharisee and the woman who had anointed the feet of Jesus. The anointing spoken of here was a different anointing that took place at the home of Simon the leper. Love is the greatest motivator in life. Love is an action word. Love is a verb. Jesus is love. Jesus loves you, and he loves me. This I know, as we used to sing, for the Bible tells me so. So, you would think that Jesus being on the other side of the Jordan River, as it says in chapter 10, verse 40, Jesus went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. You would think on hearing from the messengers that Mary and Martha sent, that he would immediately drop everything he was doing and, and go and heal this friend that he loved. But that's not what happened. Number one in your outline, there are times when God's love for you and for me is magnified in his divine delay. There are times when God's love for you, his love for me, it's magnified in his divine 
delay. And we hate those two words, divine delay. Now, Jesus, it says, loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Well, gee, he just says he loves him, but he's staying. What's with that? Why this divine delay? He loves them, but he stays away. He delays coming to him. Now, because we know the outcome of the story, we're not concerned with, with all the human emotions that are played out in the midst of God's delay. The perceived silence or seemingly uncaring attention to the situation, because we know the outcome of it if we know our Bibles. But when the Lord's divine delay enters into our circumstances, it becomes a whole different story. None of us embrace God's divine delay in our lives. It makes no sense to us that God says he loves us and then he delays answering our prayers or healing us or our deliverance from unwanted circumstances. But notice verse 5 and 6 go together. In essence, Jesus stayed away because of his love for this family. Being a disciple becomes extremely challenging when we are faced with the Lord's divine delay. But a disciple of Jesus must learn to trust and at all times and in all situations, trust his love. Verse four gives us some much needed perspective when experiencing everyday life as a disciple of Jesus. When we begin to understand this truth, divine delay will be easier to embrace rather than shy away from. Letter A, the Lord seeks to be glorified in your life. Do you believe that? That the Lord seeks to be glorified in your life? We pick this up. So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. You see, the Lord seeks to be glorified in your life, and he'll use all kinds of circumstances to bring glory, even death, even our death can glorify God. I've seen people come to Christ because of a funeral that was done of a godly saint. I've seen people ministered to at funerals and God glorifies himself in the death of his saints. Precious in the eyes of God are the death of his saints. But in this particular situation, in other words, this sickness isn't for the purpose of death. Though the sickness would result in death, its purpose differs from death. Rather, the sickness is for the benefit of God's glory in order that the Son of God may be glorified through it. I have a friend that started the church in his home about 30 years ago. He's a very talented worship leader, and he, and he wrote a song that... I learned and then taught to the ministry that I was doing and the small groups that we would do as a worship leader myself. Simple words, be glorified, be glorified, be glorified, be glorified. Be glorified in the heavens, be glorified in the earth, be glorified in this temple, Jesus. Jesus, be thou glorified. The temple is us. Be glorified in us. Beautiful song. Very simple, yet very profound. So letter B, love, trust, and surrender. They're hallmarks of true discipleship. This song that my friend wrote, it's a prayer sung with an attitude of compliance and surrender to the will of God, to surrender to God's will for our lives, even when that means he might delay his intervention for a while in our circumstances, or he may not even intervene at all. It's a bold thing to pray. It's a bold thing to, to live. It's a bold thing to sing. Paul said to the church at Thessalonica in his second letter to them, we constantly pray for you that our God may count you worthy of his calling and that by his power, he may fulfill every good purpose of yours 
in, act, in every act prompted by your faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ be glorified in you and you in him. To pray that the Lord be glorified in your life, no matter what, implies that you possess love and trust and have surrendered to the Lord's will, your life, in order that he may be glorified. Let us go to Judea again, Jesus said. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were, were, were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If, if anyone... Uh, Anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Judea uh, had become a dangerous place for Jesus and his disciples. The hostility and the hatred from the past brought the disciples to the conclusion that Jesus should not journey back to Judea. But Jesus spoke in a veiled way to illustrate that it would not be too dangerous to go to Bethany. In one sense, he was speaking of walking, living in the physical light or darkness. In the spiritual realm, when one lives by the will of God, he's safe. Living in the realm of evil may be dangerous, but as long as he's following God's plan, no harm would come till the appointed time. Applied to people, then they should have responded to Jesus while he was in the world as its light. Soon he would be gone. And so would this unique opportunity. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Let us go to him. Imagine what the disciples are thinking. On his arrival, scripture says, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. F.F. F. Bruce says, Rabbis believed that a deceased person's soul revisited the tomb the first three days, but left it presently from the fourth day onwards. Death was then irreversible. It is possible that this belief is also implied in the further reference to Lazarus being in the tomb for four days in verse 39. Something to think about. In verse 18 of chapter 11, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. According to the ancient Jewish ritual, those who came to console with the mourners had to return with them from the grave to the house. At the house, they would station themselves in a circle around the mourners, repeating prayers and offering consolation. The rule was that this circle of consolers should consist of not less than 10 persons, but it usually consisted of many more. In token of grief, the couches upon which the mourners and the, and the consolers sat were lowered so as to come nearer to the ground or else all sat upon the ground. The consolers remained with the mourners during the days of mourning. Furthermore, the consoler did not speak until the mourner spoke, and the mourner had the privilege further of indicating by nodding that they were now comforted and that the consolers need not continue to sit around any longer. So there's quite a group of people in this place. Martha comes out to meet Jesus on the way. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. The words of Martha are spoken with a kind of repressed uh, rebuke mingled with persistent faith. There's no doubt that she believed that if Jesus had been with them, her brother would have been healed. But Jesus was going to glorify himself through the death of Lazarus while increasing the faith of those present. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. 
The words from Jesus are taken by Martha as a practice of conventional words of comfort offered by those Jews who believed in the resurrection at the end of days. But Jesus was not talking about the last day. He was talking about what he was about to do right then and right now. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. It's not an event, it's me. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, who was to come into the world. What did Jesus mean when he said that he is the resurrection and the life? John R. Kallenberger III says, Jesus said that he embodied the vital power to bring the dead to life. The one who believes in Christ has eternal life that transcends physical death. Those who live and believe will never die, but will make an instant transition from the old life to the new life. On this basis, he asked her directly whether she believed. Albert Barnes says, shall never die. As the dead, though dead, shall yet live, so the living shall have the same kind of life. They shall never come into eternal death. Shall by no means die forever says the Greek. And it's been said a believer's death issues a new life. In fact, the life of a believer is of such a quality that he will never die spiritually. He has eternal life. And the end of physical life is only a sleep for his body until the resurrection unto life. At death, the spiritual part of a believer's soul goes to be with the Lord. So when Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was, she saw him and she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping. Something happened. Mary, Martha, all those who knew Jesus were all experiencing the motions that accompany the loss of a loved one. They were all walking in the valley of the shadow of death. Their bond of fellowship had experienced a devastating loss because Lazarus has died. He was dead. To all those involved, there was a finality associated with death. It was in this state that God, through the person of Jesus, gives man a glimpse of who he is. Remember, the Lord chose to dwell among us. It is because of this longing for fellowship we see something of God's greatness and his goodness. It brings us to letter C. The tears of Jesus reveal his humanity and understanding of our deepest sorrows. It says, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And then verse 35, two words in the whole verse, Jesus wept. He wept. He was broken. He experienced that loss. As a man, he experienced that grief. He experienced the work of the enemy. The result of the curse, death, the result of sin. And he wept. And then he said, and then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Oh, it was so much deeper than his, just his love for Lazarus. It was his, his passion and his love for all of man. When Jesus wept, he was entering into the suffering as a man, entering in the suffering of others. He was often moved with compassion. And in this situation, he weeps over the loss of Lazarus and he weeps over and entered into the grief of, of Mary and Martha. And Jesus entered into the sorrow and grief of his friends. And through this story in scripture, we see the evidence that the Lord is close to us. In Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saved those who are crushed in spirit. God was incarnate in Jesus. 
And he was in the midst of human sorrow and grief and the pain and the sorrow of the human heart was breaking his heart and he shared in it. And just as Jesus shared in the sorrow and grief of Mary and Martha, he shares in our sorrow and grief, especially when we experience the kind of sorrow and grief that crushes our spirit. See, letter D, Jesus is close to the brokenhearted because he has been broken. Jesus is close to the brokenhearted because he has been broken. Isaiah 53, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Furthermore, Scripture also reveals to us something else about the Lord. Number two on your outline, Jesus revealed to us his righteous indignation over the curse of sin. Jesus reveals to us his righteous indignation over the curse of sin. He groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Groaned. That actually in the Greek means to snort with anger like a bull snorts to have indignation on, to murmur against, to be moved, to be very angry. John 13, 33 in the New Living Translation says, a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. The New Living Translation says, Jesus was angry as he arrived to the tomb. God has a righteous anger. Listen to what Watkins says. The original meaning of the word groan is to snort as of horses. Passing to the moral sense, it expresses disturbance of mind an agitation. This may express itself in sharp abnonition, in words of anger against a person or in a physical shudder, answering to the intensity of the emotion. In each of the earlier gospels, the word is accompanied by an object upon which the feeling is directed. In the present context, it does not go beyond the subject of the feeling. Here it is, in the spirit. And in verse 38, it is in himself. Both mean the same thing. The, the, the point to the inner moral depth of his righteous indignation. Taken in connection with what follows, some such rendering is required as he was indignant in the spirit and caused himself to shudder. And then again in verse 38, Jesus once more deeply moved came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. So in verse 33, Jesus is angry. In verse 35, Jesus weeps. In verse 38, we see him angry again. Why was Jesus broken and angry? Jesus was weeping over the tragic consequences of sin, which is the process of death. Scripture say, states that the soul that sins will die. With the fall of man comes the process of death. Adam and Eve would have lived forever. They never would have experienced death if they didn't sin. But you see, because we're in that sinful nature, all of us at one time or another, we will experience the tragic consequences of the curse of sin. When God created Adam and Eve, he, they were created to live forever. They were not supposed to experience sin and death, but because they were given a will to obey and to make a choice to express their love to God through an act of willful obedience, they chose to disobey instead. And that act of rebellion was sin. And sin changed everything. Sin brings death. And because we're born into the consequences of the fall, we all possess a sinful nature and death comes to our circle of friendships. And all of man will experience as a consequence of the fall. As scripture states, just as a man is destined to die once after that to face judgment. And Jesus hates the consequences of sin. In fact, the Bible tells us that there is one thing we should hate, one thing that we should be angry about, sin. Proverbs 8.13, the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Psalm 97.10, the, the Lord loves those who hate evil. Therefore, Jesus expressed a holy, righteous anger over sin and the consequences of sin, which is death. And he weeps because that death separates it separates. Death is a thief. It steals and it robs and it affects us. 
It separates and it causes deep emotional grief and anguish of the soul. And because we are made in the image of God, we experience anger over sin, especially death. What most people fail to realize is that when they become angry over death, which, by the way, is part of the grieving process, they are expressing a reaction to the consequences of sin and death. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor. For he has been there for four days. The King James says, by this time he stinketh. The New Living Translation says that the smell will be terrible. The stench of being in the tomb four days, though, is a testimony that Lazarus was dead. His body was decomposing. There was no life in his body. His spirit is gone. The only thing that's living are worms and maggots. Number three, when Jesus glorifies himself in your circumstances, faith multiplies. When Jesus glorifies himself in your circumstances, faith multiplies multiplies. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. This was an incredible moment in history. Remember that in verse 18, John tells us that Jerusalem was only two miles away from Bethany. These Jews became believers after this miracle. All these mourners, all these people that came to console and to mourn with Mary and Martha, they're about to experience the glory of God. It says, therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, they put their faith in him. It was a surprising thing to announce that he had not intended to prevent Lazarus' death. But it was still more surprising that it was for their sakes. What had they to do with it? Now, while all believers are independent of each other and each stands or falls to his own master, yet the trials of one are often intended to benefit another. The laws of vicarious suffering holds the race. A parent suffers for a child, a child for a parent. Joseph was sold into Egypt that Israel might go into Palestine. Peter's imprisonment may have been needed to, to discipline Rhoda's faith. And, and Paul's confinement may have been ordered for the jailer's conversion. Let us be resigned that when we suffer for others, and attent, an attentive when others suffer for us. So here we go, number four. The divinity of Christ is revealed in his conquering sin and the grave the very source of man's greatest anguish, the divinity of Christ, of Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, is revealed in his conquering sin and the grave, the very source of man's greatest anguish. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out, come forth. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Lazarus needed help from others to remove the grave clothes. Even, though, even those who experienced new birth in Jesus Christ must shed the grave clothes of the past sin and shame. To many of those who witnessed this miracle, the divinity of Jesus was made clear to them as they placed their faith in him. Only Jesus has the power to conquer death. And with a divine shout, life was restored. Lazarus was raised. The tears of sorrow and mourning were dispersed in an instant and turned into joy. I can't even imagine what it must have been like to be there at that moment. But the sad reality is that there were still some people who witnessed and most likely still did not believe in the divinity or the claims of Jesus. And just as then, there are those who deny, reject, and ignore the miracles of Jesus. In essence, in their unbelief, they search for ways to discredit and to put to death the faith of believers or believers themselves. You see, men still plot to kill Jesus. 
you watch what unfolds. In the, in the midst of this amazing miracle, it says, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. They're more worried about their position as a Sanhedrin. Worried about their nation. They don't even get the fact that it's about sin. That was their slavery. They're in bondage to the Romans, but they're in bondage to their sinful nature. They're blinded by the God of this world. They don't get it. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who, had, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. He was under the unction of the Holy Spirit, and he had no clue. That was a prophecy. You do not realize it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. Prophetic. And not only for that nation, he goes on but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, this is sad, they plotted to take his life. They had a miracle. There was testimony of this miracle. And they had prophecy. And they rejected both. This small family from Bethany experienced the anguish of the soul once again. When Jesus was crucified and put into a grave and the stone was placed in front of his entrance, Jesus willingly sacrificed his life as the ultimate sin offering. But he would conquer sin and death once again and once and for all. In doing this, Jesus entered into all of man's experiences and knows what, is, what it is to suffer. In being the perfect man, Jesus experienced these things in a deeper way than we ever will. Because God wanted to restore man's broken fellowship with himself. He gave his son as a ransom, as a mediator, as a redeemer to bring men back into the intimacy of fellowship. Listen to what the prophet Isaiah said. He prophesied 800 years before this was fulfilled. He was despised and rejected by men, speaking of Jesus. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we consider him stricken by God and smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearers is silent, he, so he did not open his mouth. It wasn't long after Lazarus was raised from the dead that Jesus went into Jerusalem. We call it Palm Sunday. It's what we're celebrating right now. People were singing Hosanna, God save us. Not understanding what they were singing, what they were shouting. In their mind's eye, Jesus is gonna save them from Roman rule and restore the nation to its former glory. No, Jesus was coming to die for them. To die for their sins, to put them under a new covenant that we now are under. Many people don't understand on this day that he entered into Jerusalem, it's also known as Lamb Selection Day. It's also, no, also known as the time in which fathers of households would, would purchase a lamb to be brought and to be offered as a sacrifice on the Passover. Jesus entered into the city 
as many people did that week to celebrate Passover. And then Jesus would be crucified on Passover. The same moments in which they were driving the nails through his hands and driving the spikes through his feet into the cross. This Lamb of God, that same moment they were crucifying, or they, were, they were sacrificing lambs. Jesus fulfilled the ultimate sacrifice. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Listen to the words of this song that's about 30 years old. Walking on the road to Jerusalem, the time had come to sacrifice again. My two small sons, they walked beside me on the road. The reason that they came was to watch the lamb. Daddy, daddy, what will we see there? There's so much that we don't understand. So I told them of Moses and Father Abraham. And I said, dear children, watch the lamb. For there will be so many in Jerusalem today, we must be sure the lamb doesn't run away. And then I told them of Moses and Father Abraham. And I said, dear children, watch the lamb. The lamb that they were going to sacrifice. And when we reached the city, I knew something must be wrong. There were no joyful worshipers, no joyful worship songs. I stood there with my children in the midst of angry men. And then I heard the crowd cry out, crucify him. We tried to leave the city, but we could not get away. Forced to play in this drama, a part I did not want to play. Why upon this day were men condemned to die? Why were we standing here? We're soon they would pass by. I looked and said, even now they come. And the first one cried for mercy, and the people gave him none. The second was violent. He was arrogant and loud. I can still hear his angry voice screaming at the crowd. Then someone said, there's Jesus. And I could scarce believe my eyes. A man so badly beaten, he barely looked alive. Blood poured from his body from the thorns upon his brow, running down the cross and falling to the ground. I watched him as he struggled. I watched him as he fell. The cross came down upon his back. The crowd began to yell. In that moment, I felt such agony. In that moment, I felt such loss until a Roman soldier grabbed my arm and screamed, you carry his cross. At first, I tried to resist. Then his hand reached for his sword. And so I knelt and took the cross from my Lord. I placed it on my shoulder and started down the street. The blood that he'd been shedding was running down my cheek. They led us to Golgotha. They drove nails in his feet and hands. And yet upon the cross, I heard him pray, Father, forgive them. Oh, never have I seen such love in any other eyes, and to thy hands I commit my spirit, he prayed, and then he died. I stood for what seemed like years. I'd lost all sense of time until I felt two tiny hands holding tight to mine. My children stood there weeping. I heard the oldest say, Father, please forgive us. The lamb ran away. Daddy, Daddy, what have we seen here? There's so much that we don't understand. So I took them in my arms and faced the cross and said, Dear children, watch the Lamb. Because Jesus dealt with sin and its tragic consequences of death, he did it by becoming the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and he conquered death. Anyone who places their faith in him, experiences his victory. You see, right now, the small family that was from Bethany, they're united with Jesus in heaven, along with multitudes of believers. Death has been swallowed up in his victory. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus will never die, but will live throughout eternity because of Jesus, the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And we have a wonderful invitation not just to receive Christ as our Lord and Savior, but to experience 
eternal life. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Saved from your sins. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you confess and that you're saved. As scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Today is Lamb Selection Day. We know it as... Palm Sunday, when people rejoiced. But it's a week to reflect on what took place. Make this week a habitual time of watching the Lamb, His passion. Read again His agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. Survey the wondrous cross.